Hey there, gang. I've got a bit of a treat today. This is a Martin guitar made in 1926, which many people would consider the height of their golden period. It's an 018, but it's not a standard one. This is an 018K, which means it's got a koa wood top, sides, and back. The whole body is made from that rare Hawaiian wood. Now I don't see very many of these guitars, and I imagine you don't either, so it could be a good opportunity for us to learn something about them, and this needs some repair work, so I'm sure we'll have some fun. The owner of this guitar is in a remarkably rare position, in that he's had some conversations with Dick Boak, who is the longtime historian for the Martin Guitar Company. And uh, together, using the serial number and the production batch code dates, they've managed to track down who exactly it was who was responsible in large part for assembling this guitar. It's this man here, this is Earl Hartzell, and the year previous he's here sanding some ukulele sides. The funny thing about this picture though is if you look at that guitar body that's sitting in front of the sander, that's an 018K. Pretty cool, huh? I think it's great that, you know, this is an anonymous guitar made in a batch situation almost 100 years ago, and we can pinpoint who was the person who made it. There's a label inside here that says H.T. Tunica & Company, which was a major Chicago dealer in the 1920s and 30s. So it's possible Al Capone owned this guitar, and maybe he left some things inside. Let's check it out. While we're here, let's have a look at these striations that run across the back from a circular saw. Those are very reminiscent to the ones I saw inside that Weisenborn guitar I worked on last year from the same period. I suppose it's possible that maybe there was a wood importer who was bringing the wood in from Hawaii. Maybe he cut it really, really thin to maximize the yield. And the manufacturer saw that and realized, well, let's just surface the outside and leave the inside raw so we have enough material to work with. Now, this guitar has seen some repairs over the years. The current owner is, of course, a left-hander, so it's uh, had a left-handed bridge conversion on here. Um, we're actually getting to the point now where, on some of these guitars, you can go back and find other repair guys' blogs and see what they did to them over the years. When this current owner got the guitar, it had a different bridge on it. It was not the original bridge, and it was not very Martin-like. Um, I'm sure it functioned fine, but it just it looked different. It, it stuck out as a non-Martin bridge. So someone has replaced it with this. This is a uh, pyramid style bridge. I don't know whether that was made by them or maybe it was an aftermarket bridge, but it's it's okay. It's a little bit dry looking and a little bit rough. I might, before we're done, um, sand that a little bit and oil it up. These I think might be the original pegs. Um, there's a crack here that's been glued up previously. Little scars here and there. There's actually ghosting from two different pick guards that were placed on here at different at some point in the past. Um, they look almost. It, I know it's difficult to see, but it looks like they might have almost been like a flamenco style gopiador. But those are gone now. The finish on this guitar is funny. Um, it looks pretty original. Uh, there are little fissures and cracks, but it's got this kind of milky, overcast look to it. Uh, it's slightly gray. Koa is, when it gets older, kind of a rosy yellow colored wood. Um, this finish is obscuring it slightly, whatever it is. 1926 could be lacquer, could also be a shellac based padding varnish. Um, I don't know what Martin was using in that year. The headstock's in really good shape. Um, so good that I might suspect it's been oversprayed. The finish on here doesn't have the kind of crackle that's on the rest of the body. And usually on these slot heads you'll see a lot of damage around the uh, sides of the slot. It could just be really well preserved. Don't know. The tuners look okay. They function fine. So you see the lacquer on the back of the headstock here. There's a lot more crackalure. This is not the original nut which the owner still has, actually. It's, uh, it was originally shipped with an ebony nut, which might seem strange, but um, a lot of the Hawaiian stuff that Martin was making in the 20s, a lot of ukuleles and some of these koa-topped guitars had ebony nuts. And surprisingly, the owner actually wants to revert back to an ebony. This is a relatively recent replacement in bone. He preferred the tone of the guitar as he got it and wants to go back to that, so we'll make him a new one. This thing has some issues as well. 
several of the strings are actually too low in their slots here. I think the D string is, yeah, sitting right on top of that first fret, so it would need work anyway. But we'll make them a new one. The guitar had a neck reset not so long ago. Seems pretty tight. There is some ghosting here along the side of the heel. This happens on these older finishes where you're injecting steam. Some of the water vapor can get trapped in the finish and cause this ashy color uh, blotches. Not always easy to repair. It's one of the reasons uh, people are moving towards using dry heat and the heat stick if they can get away with it because uh, that's annoying when that happens. But we'll see, maybe we can touch it up a little bit. After the neck reset, the action on this guitar is pretty phenomenal. Um, it's about just over three and a half sixty fourths to about four and a half sixty fourths. Um, that would be about 1.2 to maybe 1.5 ish millimeters at the 12th fret. Here's the condition the owner would like to have addressed. The action at the 12th fret, as I said, is pretty phenomenal. But uh, after this neck reset and tipping the neck shaft backwards, the amount of fall away here that happens over the fingerboard extension is pretty extreme. So what's good here, by the time you reach the 15th or 16th fret, is really, really high. And the owner actually does play up here uh, at times, and he just he feels it. He wonders whether we can improve that for him. And I said we could perhaps put a wedge under here to kick up the fingerboard extension a little bit. Um, sometimes I will do that on neck resets if it's necessary. Uh, other times I won't. just depends on the conditions, how much material had to be taken off the neck and how much the angle had to be played with. So I've been hemming and hawing about this for a little while because there's a condition here that it's a bit strange. These are bar frets. Um, so these are not T-shaped. There's no tang on these. These are rectangles of metal that have been hammered into the slots. Over the body here, I'm not sure if you can see it, but the amount of ebony or the material on the fingerboard that remains underneath the bottom of those slots and the top here is only about a millimeter thick. It's very, very, very thin. Now over the portion of the neck which is free of the body, it's more like two, maybe two and a half millimeters, which is what I expect to see. This is more normal. I can't imagine a factory situation where these would have been cut that deep and uh, and put on the guitar like this. So I, I think what happened is during the neck reset, when the uh, neck was freed from the body, this area here was probably thinned down slightly, um, probably sanded flat for gluing or to clean up, you know, the bottom of it, or maybe to introduce, absolutely make sure there was going to be fall away. Um, what can the worst case scenario is when you get a guitar that has like the ski jump, where it rises up here, on a neck that's got bar frets, that can be difficult to address because you have to, you know, pull these out, sand it flat. No one wants to pull out bar frets because getting new ones that fit, there's only like one guy who sells them. And uh, none of us really keep a whole stock of these on hand. There's maybe two people in North America who do. So it's thin, you know, and I'm putting a wedge under here. I, I had to sort of, you know, think about it and get my nerve up. and. The worst case scenario I can see happening would be that maybe there's an incipient crack under one of these things that runs between the bottom of the fret and the fingerboard. I get in there with a palette knife and um, break it free. I might end up with a, a loose portion of the tang. Um, in terms of where to start that wedge, I'm looking at it. I think the 13th fret, which is still over the uh, end of the dovetail here, is pretty good. You know, I think it's well supported, the action is fine, so I'm not going to loosen the fingerboard all the way to the very end. I'll probably just do it to the 13th fret and start that as the zero point for my wedge. Returning to the bridge, I checked out the intonation and it's actually pretty darn good. Uh, it's better than you get on an original Martin bridge from this period. Uh, in the 1920s they hadn't quite figured out the amount of saddle slant that was necessary for the bass strings to play in tune yet, but this one's fine. The saddle height is extraordinary. It's a fat 3 16 of an inch, or that's like 4.7 millimeters above the surface of the bridge. And the bridge is full height as well at around 8 millimeters. So this is as tall as you would ever want it to be. Um, if you get more than about a half an inch clearance between the soundboard and the underside of the strings, on these old guitars with these very diminutive bracing, you're asking for structural problems. But they will get away with it this time because it's a hardwood top, it's koa. If this was spruce, I imagine things would start distorting. Um, as repair people, when we do neck resets, oftentimes we shoot a little bit high for the saddle height for a couple of reasons. 
The first thing is um, when you put a new tall saddle on a guitar, oftentimes there's more deformation that happens, like the soundboard will sink in front of the, um, the, the bridge a little bit more than it did previously with a lower saddle. So that eats away some of the height that you had calculated and you try to compensate for that. It's not an exact measurement and every guitar is different, so it can be difficult to figure out. Uh, the other thing is, you don't want to be the person who hands a customer back their guitar after they've paid you $500 to do this and only see a little thin sliver of saddle exposed. You'd feel pretty bad and they'd wonder why they, you know, spent all that money. So, you know, th this is tall. I would not want it to be taller. If it was, I would want to plane down the saddle slightly. In this case, we can't do that because the action is so low. So. I feel pretty good for the repair person who did that neck reset. They just got away with it, you know. They were probably sweating and managed to get away with it, and I feel good for them because it's it's in the spot that's like the absolute highest it could be, and it's still okay. Gone ahead and scored around the nut just to make sure there's nothing along the outline that would hold it in place. Don't want any lacquer chipping off or anything. tight. Okay. Mm. Yeah, don't like that. This nut was glued in with glue on the bottom of it rather than on this front face. I've mentioned this before, but when you're gluing in a nut, put a little here on the front side, the surface of the end grain. If you put it on the bottom of the slot, when it comes time to take it out again, it's just, you're going to lose some of this mahogany. It's fine, I can clean it up, but just remember that, guys. Here's the peculiar thing about Martin nuts. The Martin design, the headstock angle takes off at a point here, at the very front edge of the nut and the intersection with the fingerboard. Uh, don't get confused by the headstock facing veneer, which goes on top. The actual corner is right up here. Most other manufacturers will make the takeoff point for the angle at the back end of the nut. And with that, that allows them to use a nut blank that is cut square and straight. It's a 90 degree corner here at the front side. Can't use that in a Martin design. If you put a square blank in here, what happens is it tips awkwardly and there's a big gap up at the top end here with the fingerboard, which not only looks bad, it just it doesn't function. You don't get the proper intonation takeoff point. So we have to figure out what that angle is. Now most Martin headstocks are about 15 degrees, give or take, a little bit. Depends on the era and oftentimes these old guitars, the neck will bow forward slightly, making measurement difficult. So what I'm doing here is I'm sighting along the edge here um, and kind of like subtracting for the thickness of the headstock veneer, running that along the end of the fingerboard. And yeah, it's around 15-ish degrees, so it's standard. Have to measure the bottom of this nut, which actually fits pretty well. If you have one that doesn't or it's missing a nut, it can be a bit of a, a rigmarole to, to figure out what the angle should be when you're making a new one. To duplicate this, I have to figure out how wide it is to start off with. I'm going to disregard the angle on the bottom. I'll reference off the front surface of the nut, the one that contacts the fingerboard, because it's flat and constant. And I'm just going to pretend like it's a rectangle. And we get about, yeah, it tapers slightly. The widest, it's around 228 thousandths of an inch. Feel free to use millimeters. Got an offcut of one of my fingerboards here. This should be 250 thousandths, which it is. So that's good. I can use that and get lots of. This is about 20 thousandths extra to play around with, so I can sneak up on the fit. I'll mark that out. And of course we want to leave this a little bit generous because we not only want to raise the nut slightly, we'll take some fiddling before we get it in there in the right size. So I'll just cut that out now. When you're trying to sand something truly flat, I find it's easiest to keep flipping it end for end and trying different angles. After it's flat, I like to mark the front face and the bottom side of the nut so I don't lose track of it. I'm planing it to thickness, that 228 thousandths. 
Here I am just marking the bottom so I'll be able to track my progress as I sand the angle uh, so that it fits properly on that little angled ledge of the headstock. It's the kind of thing you've got to sneak up on incrementally. You've got to try it and sand it, try it and sand it again. Not making proceeds in the usual fashion, same as with a bone nut. I'm planing the angle on the bottom of a piece of ebony here for the fingerboard extension ramp. And uh, when I see myself on video, I'm always surprised at how fast I actually work. This is regular speed. Same here, I'm scraping to refine the surface a bit. I'm trying to keep things flat. And to do that, after scraping, I will use a big flat sanding block here. A few strokes will show me um, any high spots, which I'll go back with the scraper and then improve that. Some people get nervous when they see me using a full-size household iron to do this job, and they want me to put a whole bunch of paper and stuff on the top surface of the guitar to protect it. In my experience, well, okay, I'm actually looking for a smaller ceiling-sized iron, so those people won't be nervous next time. But as far as protecting the top, I'm not using a whole lot of heat here, and I'm checking it frequently. I find that if I actually, on a shellac finish like this, if I put paper on there, the heat's usually enough to soften it so that it will stick to the paper and cause a mess of the finish. So it's, it's actually safer in this case not to have anything on the top. So the metal frets here, um, they're nice and big and they extend the heat all the way down to the fingerboard really quickly. So I'll heat it up for a minute or two and then take it off and then check it again and see how I'm progressing. The finish on the top isn't sticky so I feel safe using a piece of regular printer paper here to protect the surface a little bit as I get my palette knife in there. I like using these angled ones because they give me a slightly better attack on the uh, on the side here. I can sort of wiggle it in and I often use two palette knives in conjunction with each other just to keep from diving into the grain. After that I'm using just a little bit of paste wax here. Um, that's going to protect things from the glue when I glue the wedges in. I actually decided to do this in three different pieces because the center seam was slightly was loose. Uh, There's a little bit of a hump in there. It was difficult to make it sit flat so I cut it into three pieces using fish glue here. It's very similar to hide glue. Easily reversible if need be. And um, I'll just get those in there and square them up with a piece of plywood, make sure they're in good. And I can do some cleanup with a little bit of a damp cloth. I've taped some blocks up inside the guitar here so that I have a good surface to clamp to. You wouldn't want the clamp sitting on the braces or against the top of the instrument. That's a real no-no. They'll make a mess of things. Only took three clamps. After the glue is good and dry, I can use some sandpaper and small scrapers to blend the ebony of the wedge in with the fingerboard, try to make them disappear. I'm protecting the top of the instrument with a very thin piece of sheet steel here, so I'm not sanding against it. Here's the proper place to put some glue for attaching a nut on the front surface there. It's actually too much glue in this case. I had to go back and clean it up after I was done. Ew, some squeeze out. Not good. It came off just fine. I'm going to try to get rid of some of this ghosting along the side of the heel here. I'll demonstrate a technique which um, you should be careful with. This is a vintage finish. It probably contains shellac and the solvent I'm using, which is denatured alcohol, will burn right through it if I leave it in contact for any length of time. Um, basically what I'm doing is going to be the final step of French polishing, which uh, is called spiriting off. This is a little Q-tip dipped in the alcohol and the alcohol is hygroscopic. It attracts water molecules. And what happens is the water that's trapped in the surface of the finish gets sucked right up to the top and it will evaporate along with the alcohol. So again, have to keep this moving fast and we don't linger. If I keep it there, it's gonna burn. So I just I come off like an airplane. There's another little patch on this side here. Very lightly dampened. And the movements are very, very light on the surface too. That took care of it. 
Works better on like lacquer. The alcohol won't hurt the lacquer. It would hurt the shellac. Here's a shot of the finished nut. On a wood nut like this, make sure you don't make those string slots too deep. Otherwise, you're prone to popping off the end grain, those little pieces on the ends. So just half the diameter of the string. Don't need very much more than that. Here's the fingerboard extension with what seems like much more reasonable action all the way along. And wonder of wonders, this thing was so flat that I didn't even have to dress those frets, which is something that doesn't happen very often, and I was quite glad. Anyway, I'll try to play the guitar a little bit for you. Again, this is left-handed, and I'm a righty, so it's going to be upside down and backwards, so forgive me, but it might give you some indication of how it sounds. <laughs> 